History can be found anywhere, even in your own backyard. So join us as we search the land, looking for the stories that helped shape this nation. Come on the porch, grab a drink, and join us for a little bit of history from the homestead. Hello, I'm your host, Thomas Carroll. During the last few days of May 1889, an unprecedented weather system settled over Cambria County, PA. By May 31st, nearly 10 inches of rain had fallen. The water level in Wake Connemall had risen to a dangerous level. With the spillway, with the spillway efficiency reduced by debris clogging the fish grates, and no drain pipes in which to lower the water level, a handful of men worked tirelessly but in vain to stop the lake from cresting over the earthen dam. Around 2.50 p.m., the dam collapsed, releasing 3.8 billion gallons of water rushing down the steep and narrow river valley. This wall of water was reported to be nearly 70 feet high at times. This wave picked up debris of all sizes, from fence posts to 80-ton railroad locomotives. Almost an hour after the collapse, this wall of water hit Johnstown. I had the opportunity to speak with park ranger Elizabeth Shope about the flood, and here is our conversation. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this the second part basically of our episode uh we're still talking with the wonderful elizabeth show but now we've kind of moved over to the johnstown johnstown flood national memorial and we're wondering about the the tie in between the two so we're just going to kind of pick up where we left off with lake Connemaw. that was the tie in that was built for the main line uh, and anybody who's familiar with the Johnstown flood knows about that, which we're going to, we'll cover that all as, as we go. So uh, the, the original building of the, the dam, which I want, I want everybody to think it was, it was built by the railroad and it would, the dam was, had actually broken what, twice before? And so it was built by the state of Pennsylvania and it was then owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, so the Pennsylvania Railroad would purchase the entire right of way for the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal in 1857. So they would inherit the South Fork Dam as, as part of their purchase. And the Pennsylvania Railroad didn't um, they built their own series of reservoirs. So, um, but I wanted to go back for just a second and and mention that, you know, funds were approved to build the South Fork Dam in 1836. It didn't get finished until the eight, early 1850s. So it took a really long time to build the South Fork Dam. And um, as, as Tom mentioned, you know, the tie-in with the Portage Railroad, so once it was finally built, it only served that original purpose for supplying the canal basin in Johnstown with water for just a few years, um, because by the later 1850s, it has a whole new owner, which is the Pennsylvania Railroad. And yeah, so it broke in 1862 when it was owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad, and there was a a, a defect in um, near a defect in the foundation near. Um, the stone culvert at the base of the dam. And at that time, it had a lot of its original safety features. It had discharge pipes, it had uh, a control tower. And in the control tower, you could control how fast or slow you let water out of the lake. It was not uh, filled to capacity at that time. So they were able to slowly let the water drain out of the lake and it didn't cause a lot of 
there wasn't a lot of attention on it. Um, it got a, a mention in the newspaper, no loss of life. Uh, there were some property damage, you know, washed away some some timber in South Fork, some railroad tracks, um, and only put a few feet of water into the river. So it wasn't really something that was a big, it, it wasn't a big break um, like it was in 1889. It, the, the water was let out very gradually. Um, but but it was something that that people would remember um, definitely, and and they would bring that up after the 1889 flood. You know, they would say, "Well, we remember when this dam broke before, and you know, it 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 didn't cause a lot of death and destruction." So you know, I I can can see why why people you know weren't worried about. The dam breaking because they had an, an experienced a break before. And you you mentioned the the drain pipes, which after the dam was rebuilt again before the the big break in eighteen eighty nine, they didn't put the the pipes in. What happened to those, and why why didn't they put them? Because I they were still there. Yeah, so it it's believed that. So it was owned by the state first, then the railroad, and then uh, a man named John Riley from the Altoona area purchased the lake bed, which was empty at that time. So after the break in the early 1860s, it sat empty. Um, John Riley purchased it, held on to it for a few years, and then he sold it at a loss to Benjamin Ruff, who was the first president of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. And that's the group that owned it on May 31st, 1889. So it's believed that he may have taken those pipes out to make up for, you know, the loss um, in, in selling the dam to Benjamin Ruff. I so see. taken out, sold for scrap is the, is the, the theory. Huh. And, and we're, you're, we're going to talk about, and we'll hear about the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club a lot. That was there was some well-to-dos there. We mentioned earlier steel and stuff in Johnstown. We're talking people like Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick and that were, the, these were essentially almost kings of industry. Yeah, the so the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was a group of wealthy industrialists from Pittsburgh who were looking for somewhere out side of the city of Pittsburgh to spend time and it's it's fairly easy to get to you can take a train from Pittsburgh to South Fork from there you can take a carriage up from South Fork across the top of the dam to the clubhouse and cottages so they would eventually build buildings right along the lake so it was a nice escape from the busy industrial humid city of Pittsburgh to come and enjoy some some quiet time, some you know a nice uh, mountain breeze on a hot day. So they were out of Pittsburgh. They were too far away if they needed to get back. But it was it was a nice it was a nice quiet place. Uh, it's a few miles from South Fork, so it's nice and quiet here. Yeah, in which you mentioned about taking the carriages right across the top of the dam. They they actually slightly lowered the dam. To accommodate the passage of carriages across. Correct. Yeah. So the there were some some changes when the club rebuilt the dam. Um, those outlet pipes that you had mentioned earlier that were were taken out were not replaced. Um, the top of the dam was widened. Um, there was sort of a sag in the middle. Um, the level of the lake was higher, um, and there was a fish screen installed. Um, near the spillway to keep the fish that the club stocked in the lake uh, from, you know, going down into um, getting out of the dam where other people would be able to, to catch those fish. So a lot of different changes done to what the club would call Lake Conema. And that would, that would prove to not be such great changes as we move through the 1880s. And, and you, uh, you'd mentioned the clubhouse before, which that that's also really neat to see. And if you if you think about it now, it's it's right in the middle of town. Yes. But before that was all lake water. That gives you an idea of how big the lake was. 
Yes. No, the landscape has has changed quite a bit since then. So, and and you're right. I always tell people <laughs> that you know they can drive past the clubhouse and some of the remaining cottages that sat right along the lakeshore. But you have to use your imagination because the present day town of St. Michael grew up in you know where the in in the empty lake bed. So when you drive past the clubhouse and cottages, it seems like you're driving through the community, but those would have been the only structures that were out there for the most part. There were some farms and and things around where the lake was around the area, but right on the lakeshore, it was just the, the, the clubhouse and cottages. Exactly. And which, you know, to visit the, the visitor center there at the, at the flood memorial park, you basically drive through the, almost the very bottom of the original lake bed itself past the dam to get uh, to where the visitor center is. Yeah, on your on your way into the park, you're sort of doing a loop around where the lake was. Yeah, you're sort of driving through where the lake would have been through St. Michael and then sort of following the outline of, of the lake up to the visitor center. Which also, that's a fun place to visit because that's, uh, uh, I can't, I'm going to be honest, I can't remember his name. The Basically, the supervisor's house was there. Oh, Colonel um, Unger. Yes. He was the so Benjamin Ruff would pass away um a few years before 1889. So Colonel Unger would become the second president of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. So at the park we have um his his farmhouse um is is park offices today. And the visitor center is built to look like the barn that sat on his property. So if you are standing on the dam looking up at the hillside here it looks very similar to what it would have looked like in the 1880s and that's really neat because yeah and if you think about anybody again with familiar with the area if you go up what's our modern day 219 now you you get a you can see see the dam you can see the the buildings at quick glance if you know where to look and uh, and actually even the spillway you can see the spillway was not a part of the dam itself yeah, so you can you can see the hillside here going across 219. And yeah, if you know where to look, you can you can see the dam abutments. And that's what I was gonna ask you was because I didn't I didn't know if the visitor center if that was supposed to be like a, a barn or something. I I did not actually know that. Yeah, so there is a a photograph taken in the 1880s of the hillside with the original barn that sat on the property so um it 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 looks very similar to that today and it, it and it's it's super unique which that's another one again i recommend everybody going we we actually visited there i took my my youngest son and he loved he loved it, it it's not big but there's a lot of interest there and you can even just come spend 15 minutes at least it's it's really nice yeah, we have a, a park movie that's 35 minutes long, and then we have two floors of exhibits that talk about the history of the South Fork Dam, the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, the flood, and some of the recovery efforts. So we we've had we've had our triumph and we talked about the the building and the railroad and stuff. So now I guess we have to I guess we'll counter that with tragedy, the great flood of in Johnstown of 1889, which was, long story short, the direct result of this dam failing when it was at full capacity. Yeah, so the South Fork Dam broke on Friday, May 31st, 1889, at about 3.10 p.m., um, sending 20 million tons of water 14 miles down the Connemaw Valley to Johnstown. Um, it would go through the towns of South Fork, Mineral Point, East Connemaw, Woodvale, and Johnstown. Um, and the scientists who have done estimates on how much water is 20 million tons of water, they equate that to the force of the Niagara River as it reaches the falls. So if you imagine turning on the, the power of Niagara Falls down the Connemaw Valley for the 35 minutes that it took the lake to drain, um, that is hard to imagine 
the power of the water that was unleashed on the Connemaw Valley that and, day. And almost like a perfect storm, uh, unprecedented rainfall leading up to the the steepness of the the river valley and the gorge down through. And the fact that even before the dam broke, Johnstown was pretty well flooded anyway. It was very common for Johnstown to flood. Yeah, there were a lot of factors that you mentioned. Um, so you have the dam not in the best shape. Um, you have 30,000 people living in the Connemaw Valley and building closer and closer to, to River's Edge. Um, you have a large timber industry. You have the geography of the Connemaw Valley. Um, right, you're you're right. You know, um, Johnstown was used to spring flooding. People said that was springtime in Johnstown. So, I imagine many people on the morning of May thirty first. You know, the streets were full of water. That wasn't necessarily cause for alarm. Now, as the day progressed, you know, this was the most water that people had seen in the streets um so and you also had rumors throughout the 1880s that the south fork dam was going to break and going back to that 1862 break you know there were people that said well the dam broke before and we were fine and they were and there's no way that they would have known of all of the changes that had taken place here so some people were very worried about what would happen if the dam were to break and and other people said you know there were people who every time it rained would say that today's the day the south fork dam is going to break so unfortunately it was said quite often throughout town um, and there were a lot of events that made people feel one way or another um about the possibility of yeah. of the dam breaking yeah a little little bit of the boy that cried wolf syndrome almost yeah i mean yeah it it it, it was 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 said a lot and and people who left their homes at some point in the day when the water became too high for comfort um david mccullough in his book used the word uh, i believe it was sheepishly they they went sheepishly across town because people knew the looks that they were going to get for leaving their homes, you know, or when they were coming back and it was just another rainstorm and the South Fork Dam held like it always did. But unfortunately, you know, all of those factors that we talked about earlier just just all came together, unfortunately, on on May 31st and created the events of that day. Yeah, in which we'll, we'll uh, actually just talk about the dam a little bit more on that day for brief. It they had basically patched it with loose dirt and straw. It wasn't engineering at all. They just filled holes in with whatever they had. Yeah, so when the dam was rebuilt, um, no engineer um, was consulted. Um, also, at that time, it, you didn't have to have someone looking at what you were doing, but... Thankfully, now we have groups and organizations who um, dam safety, you know, Army Corps of Engineers and things that that check up on those things now. But but that was not a requirement at that time. And yeah, using whatever materials were at hand to um, to get the dam ready to fill it back up from that break in the early 1860s. So it, it sat empty from the early 1860s um, until the club rebuilt the dam. Yeah, and and to, th and to think it's, it could still happen, this is a little off topic, but we think about Johnstown, they've had quite, quite a few great floods. Seven, 1977 was another one. We're not as big, but there was a couple of dams that failed then that really increased the floodwaters in Johnstown. So they don't call it the flood city for nothing. Yeah, so unfortunately, Johnstown has had other major floods since 1889. There was the St. Patrick's Day flood in 1936 and then July of, of 1977. Yeah, and we'll go back. I mean, even, you know, in 
in 89, Johnstown was a bustling city. You had uh, the Cambria Iron Works, which was not one of Carnegie's mills. It was a direct competitor to his, but it was one of the leading steel producers in the world at the time. Cambria, the Cambria Iron Company, that was the big business in Johnstown um, in the 1880s that, you know, people, most people knew someone that worked for Cambria Iron, had someone in their family that worked there. So, um, yeah, large output coming from, from the Iron Company in Johnstown. And I, I bring that up because I it, it sort of loops. There was a member of the Cambria Iron Works that was also a member of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, which if I'm not mistaken, he he kind of joined the club so there was a local eye to keep track of the dam itself. Uh, Daniel Morell um, was involved with the Cambria Iron Company, and he had sent up one of his engineers, John Fulton, to take a look at things and, and report back. And... John Fulton saw some some changes that he thought ought to be made. Um, so there were some letters back and forth between Daniel Morell and Benjamin Ruff, the first president of the club. And, um, you know, nothing really came from that. Benjamin Ruff um, said at the end of one letter that you and your people are in no danger from our enterprise. So Daniel Morell would join the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club as as a member, uh, as a a a member of the club, um, but residing in Johnstown. And Dana Morrell would pass away a few years before the flood as well, but we highly respected in town and, you know, didn't want to stop the club from, from doing what they were doing, offered to contribute to any changes that needed made, but was very much looking out for the folks in the Connemaw Valley and, and wanted to make sure that, you know, everything was, was as it should be with the South Fork Dam or Lake Connemaw. Right. And, and we've mentioned a few times already, David McCullough's book. I recommend anybody gets that. It is, it is an excellent book and it is very detailed about the Johnstown flood. Uh, that's, that's basically where I did a lot of my research on about the Johnstown flood many years ago. So I recommend anybody gets it. It's yeah, excellent. And and we have a lot of people that come to the park because they've read the David McCullough book, which yeah, it's, it's, it's an excellent book. And people read that book and now they want to come to the park and see see the place because they read the book and they want to see what see what they've read about. So what what move to the flood itself now we we talk about the flood we're talking about a wall of water how how big was this wall of water that hit Johnstown yeah so that's it a good question um it it varied um as it's making its way down the Connemaw Valley um it's gathering more and more debris um as it goes and a lot of people who witnessed the flood said that they couldn't see the water. They saw everything that the flood had accumulated. So you saw all of the debris coming. Um, so that's how many people, many people described it. Um, you know, as it's going to Johnstown, it, it has sort of a renewed intensity. There were some places coming down the Connemaw Valley where it would slow down a little bit um, and then sort of continue with with more force as it as it keeps going. Um, but yeah, and many people describe seeing the debris and also something that would a lot of people would mention that um, they called the death mist. So it's almost like holding your finger in front of a garden hose. Um, so you have the debris in front of the water and you have that that mist on the side oh, so that's wow. how many people described it they described it as like a, a roar like thunder i bet through every everything under the sun in that water there the, the sheer intensity of it rail i mean railroad box cars and yes and yeah. and you know just the the power of water to be able to push 30 80 ton locomotives from you know 100 yards 
up to a mile downstream is such a powerful force. Yeah, my goodness. I mean, that's that's even the 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 focal point at the at the park. There is that whole wall, which is it looks as if the flood uh, the flood debris is bursting through the wall with stuff. Which, and I'll post pictures on the website, but it's just a small portion of what oh my uh, must have looked like i i don't really know i yeah obviously yeah, wasn't there yeah, so that exhibit that you talk about you know that's that's what most people saw they saw all of the debris um you know animals horses um miles of barbed wire i mean just anything and everything yeah you you mentioned the the wire that's that's one to think about the uh the wire mill was up East Connemaw way so that it picked all of that up as well before it headed into Johnson, which the wire mill is every bit as big as Cambry Iron. So there's hundreds of miles of wire. I couldn't imagine a, a, a wave full of barbed wire coming at you. No, no. Yeah. So the, the mill was, was close to Johnstown and, and just bringing all of that, all of that with it as well. And, and many, different experiences of of people as the flood is coming into Johnstown you know some people saw it coming and had time to get out of the way some people didn't see it coming you know just people being floated for you know miles downstream hanging on to you know a roof uh anything to try to just stay out of the water there are accounts of people spending the night of may 31st hanging in trees because they're afraid of falling asleep and and losing their grip and you know falling into that churning water um i it, i just can't must. even i just i just can't even imagine and and it wasn't it wasn't just residents of town there were you know, passengers on the railroad, cause the the, uh, the R Pennsylvania Railroad then was pretty well halted at Johnstown because of all the rain and tracks were already washed out. So any even viable escape routes had been cut off. Right. So flooding with the railroads, tracks washed out earlier in the day, um, some trains stopped um, in East Connemaw couldn't make it any further but then also when you mentioned people in town may 30th the day before the flood was decoration day which later became memorial day so there were who knows how many people visiting family or friends for yeah. the holiday weekend as well yeah and incidentally anybody that's familiar with johnstown is familiar with the incline plane now that was built just after that for just such an emergency to to evacuate people because Johnstown oh as I like to say there's only one way into Johnstown it's downhill it's all downhill in the town it's at the bottom yes um it's you know built on a nearly level floodplain um and you mentioned the incline plane and for me that was my my whoa moment when I first started working here and I went to that view of Johnstown and you know you, you see the mountains rising out of Johnstown and, and you see Johnstown you know almost at the at the bottom of a like this this big bowl so to speak um but yes the incline plane was a nice um opportunity for people to live outside of the city after after the 1889 flood people a lot of people want to move to higher ground you know um but still work in the mills in town so that was a nice way to be able to go in and out of the city you can still get to work but you're not necessarily living in johnstown and it it's you know, people don't really if you've never been there you don't realize it's steep it's the steepest in the world it is steep. Uh, and now after the flood, we also have the the famous stone bridge still there to this day. But in essence, 
after everything calmed down with all that debris, you basically had Lake Connemall reformed itself in Johnstown then afterwards, essentially. A lot of that debris that comes into Johnstown is going to jam <laughs> up at the Pennsylvania Railroad Stone Bridge. And unfortunately, a little bit after the flood, um, something starts a fire at the Stone Bridge. Um, you know, you have locomotives with fuel, you have um, coal stoves, you have all different kinds of things. Um, that could start a fire and um, it's interesting because a lot of people said after the flood they didn't realize that this was just something that happened to Johnstown you have the water you have the flood you have the fire at the bridge people thought that this was Armageddon day this was happening everywhere this was this was the end of times um, and a lot of people also mentioned that fire at the Stone Bridge. You know, you have a lot of people trapped in debris at the Stone Bridge, um, as well as debris of every kind. And a lot of people talked about how eerie that glow was, how bright the fire burned. You know, you think about Johnstown after the flood, um, it gets to be dark. There, there are no electric lights anymore. Um, all of town is dark and your source of light is this fire burning in a bridge and, and knowing that there are people trapped there um, was, was really just awful for people to, to think about. Um, one man said that the fire burned so bright, you know, he could, you could read a newspaper. I, I could believe, I mean, you think about how many houses, trees, everything just, just piled up there. Yeah. And they they basically had to use dynamite to clear the debris pile. It was that entangled with railroad rail and and just that. I mean, it, to, to look at the pictures, it's astounding. It is there, you know, <clears throat> so much debris there. Um, so they brought in a a man named Kirk, and he used dynamite at the Stone Bridge and. Um, apparently felt like he wasn't making you know as much progress as as he maybe it wasn't going as quick as he would have liked so he set off like a 450 pound charge um and the residents of Johnstown were were not very happy with that um but it you know it, it took some time before you could you know see daylight through those arches I mean you just have acres and acres of of debris there you know and and just thinking about all of that debris, you know, you have to cart it away, you have to burn it. Um, and I, I, I think about the people who, like, what a long night May 31st would have been for those folks, you know, people moving from their home, you know, homes, you know, people were afraid that, you know, my house survived the flood, but is it going to stand until morning? So yeah. going to surviving structures in town like Alma Hall, um, as different gathering places in town to stay the night and you know june 1st um you know overcast like may 31st but many people described it as a you know a sunny day with blue skies um but it wasn't but i think that really speaks to you know the the shock and, and you know i you, you imagine experiencing something like that um so I, i'm sure just just people walking around in a total state of shock sort of like yeah. expressionless um you know using surviving structures like alma hall as a starting off point for trying to figure out where your home would have been um or, or you know using those structures to try and find where my house where my house was and yeah. um you know the people of Johnstown just immediately, you know, joined together, formed different committees amongst themselves to like a, a police force, um, and immediately had it had to start had to start cleaning up and you know burying the victims of the flood, searching for victims of the flood, um, 
you know, the, the temperatures remain relatively on the cool side for a few days after the flood, um, because, you know, also the spread of disease is, is a very real possibility after the flood too. Digging out basements, I mean, just, it's amazing to me, you know, I'm sure they they didn't feel like doing that, but you know, the, I, I, what a resilient group of people to be able to yeah. band together, form these committees amongst themselves, you know, get to work doing what they needed to do to clean up, um, to bury the dead. I mean, I'm yeah, in awe of of what they did in the days after. Yeah, and it's astounding. And and we think about cleanup. We have to. You do. I do kind of have to mention the one famous person everybody doesn't really think of, Clara Barton. Yes. We know the Red Cross today. Then it was in its infancy. This was the Red Cross's really big test of handling a a massive disaster, and done well at it. Yes. Yeah. So for Clara Barton's newly formed American chapter, this is one of their first, you know, big, um, big disasters. And she came to Johnstown just a few days after the flood. She was there until October, um, brought a team of doctors and nurses with her. Um, she built several Red Cross hotels, um, which were great for people to be able to, you know, get a, a clean pair of clothes, um, a, a bite to eat. Um, you know, you think about people after the flood who, who have only the clothes on their back. I mean, they, they have nothing left. There's, there's no food. So there's also this real sense of urgency of being able to get supplies into Johnstown. And that's of all, uh, supplies of all kinds. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you need medical attention, but you know, we, you also need a doctor. You also need coffins to bury the dead. You know, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it just so much was needed and, you know, a, a wonderful, um, relief effort, you know, Claire Barton, um, but also like donations coming in from, all over the country and all over the world. Um, you know, lots of countries sent money to Johnstown. You had school children who gave up their lunch money to send donations to town. Um, penitentiary baking bread and sending food to Johnstown. Um, but also food, food and supplies for the folks in the Connemaw Valley, but then thinking about everybody coming in to assist with the the cleanup and the rebuild and you know so you have a lot of people who need supplies but then you also have a lot of people coming into Johnstown in the days after the flood as yeah. well and that's, I, I try try to impress upon the scope of it uh to think about it it was the single greatest tragedy as far as loss of life up until we had our September 11th terrorist attacks that and that you think that is the scope of what it was how long that went that a great tragedy a major a major tragedy um yeah so 2209 is the official number of those who lost their lives um in the great Johnstown flood of 1889 but you know, you had 99 entire families that were lost. So a few things that we had mentioned previously, you know, there would have likely been people whose family or friends didn't know they were in Johnstown because they were just there for the holiday weekend. Or, you know, with the railroad, a lot of people moving in and out of Johnstown. You come to Johnstown, you stay for a few days, you leave, or you know, Johnstown is a a place to rest before you move on to Pittsburgh or or somewhere else. Um, you had people like Victor Heiser, whose account uh, you mentioned that you can listen to in the visitor center. He was a 16 year old orphan survivor um, who decided to leave Johnstown. Um, so there were others like him who left town in the days after the flood, who were counted among the dead, who turned up as being alive years later. But you also think about um, 
you know, like John Smith is missing, but you know, maybe he just moved to town. So we don't, he doesn't really know a lot of people or all of John Smith's family dies in the flood too. So there's no one to say, wait, he's yeah. not here anymore. But uh, so that's the official number, but you know, we don't really know. I Yeah. You know, it, it's likely a lot more than that. Um, it also doesn't account for people who died as a result of, you know, you survived the day of May 31st, but, and maybe died a couple months later as a result of an injury or, or illness or True. something associated um, from the day of May 31st. But that, that is the official number. Um, and, you know, the list of the victims of the flood what was passed around, was passed around town. Um, and um, so that's, you know, those, those names are, are listed on the, like the historical record of the, the victims of the flood. And, and that's, you know, really why our park is here today. You know, we are here to um, preserve the remains of the South Fork Dam and to remember those 2,209 people that died in the flood. Yeah. And how, we'll go back, how long did the cleanup take? Just so there's an idea. The Oh, month, <laughs> darn years. good question. Um, huh? You know, that is a good question. And that's a hard question. Um, you know, if you came into Johnstown by way of train in 1892, 1893, it would have been hard to tell that a devastating flood had hit the city a few years before. Um, so while I'm sure it felt like a lifetime to the people who were living there they really cleaned up you know i mean you know immediately started that cleanup effort and just just kept going and and i i think it's very impressive that a few years later it you know it look like this flood hadn't happened and you know many people rebuilt right where they had lost their homes um you know uh and just also you know when you mentioned the rebuilding it makes me think of you know like the camber iron company for example we we talked about them earlier mm -hmm. they wanted to get operations going as soon as possible you know, we mentioned the amount of people employed by the camber iron company and trying to give a sense of normalcy after this tragic event you know, thinking about Johnstown the days after the flood you know Johnstown was a bustling town as you had mentioned so think about you're not hearing the factory whistles you're not you know constant trains coming in and out all the time you know um wagons on the cobblestones you know it would have been, you know, almost like an like an eerie silence, you know, and a stillness in Johnstown. So Cambry Iron wanted to get people back to work as soon as possible. So, you know, hearing the factory whistle, seeing people that you knew going back to work um, was a sign of of yes, this devastating flood happened here, but we're moving forward. And um I think that would have been a, a a good thing for for people to 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 have you know they wouldn't have had like a sense of normalcy because things yeah. were 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 so different but to see familiar things starting to happen again a sort of comfort really as weird as that sounds but you know that so that, and that seems like we're, that's about a good a place as any to end, but it was great talking to you. So we started, we started with triumph tragedy and then we finished with triumph because we had to clean up. So uh, before we go, any, any closing thoughts or anything on, on the Johnstown flood that I missed? Cause there's so much that we could have covered. There we is couldn't so much. Cover we could talk for. Yeah. 
days. Yes. Yeah. So you're right. It, it's, it's a challenge to fit it into, yeah. <laughs> into to one episode, but I think we hit a lot of the, the main, the main points. And uh, yeah, I would just end with, you know, the resiliency of the folks in the Connemaw Valley after the Johnstown flood and, and their sense of, of community and coming together and everybody pitching in to, to do what's needed and to help each other out, um, is, is very inspiring. Very. And Elizabeth, thank you for taking the time today to talk to us. And again, we mentioned it in the last one, as far as pitching in, if you get a chance to volunteer anywhere, help your national park out, you might just learn something new while you're at it. Yes, we always welcome volunteers. We welcome your visit to both of our parks. Uh, we're open every day from nine to five and website's the best way to, to or our Facebook page to see what's coming up. We have lots of events planned around May 31st throughout the summer at both parks. Um, so we we invite you to um, to come visit us. Thank you Wonderful. so much for, for your time. Thank you for joining us. That has been a ton of fun to talk about it. Yes, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thanks, to everybody, for listening. Uh, remember, if you like the show, you can share it with all your friends. We can be found on all the major podcast players. Uh, we can be found on Facebook. And you can also find us and catch the show notes at historyfromthehomestead.com.